pictures of individuals who are actually checking in. We're seeing a pattern. Uh, there are some members that we don't know where you are and you are not registering. And uh, we're gonna have to reach out to you to make sure you are still a part of the Church of Christ and Forest Hill family. So please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, register uh, tonight, check in this evening so that you are accounted for. Uh, we are good to see all of those who are here in person on this evening. I wanna thank, first of all, before I get into my class this evening, those who have kind of taught, uh, I've been uh, away uh, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had a lectureship, we had other things that, that came up that uh, prevented us from being here. I wanna thank Brother Landrum for bringing the class uh, and teaching, he did a wonderful job. I wanna thank Brother Jones, Walford Jones for teaching. Uh, it is always good to see our elders uh, step in and teach uh, the class. One of the traits of eldership is apt to teach. So um, we are thankful that they are willing, ready, and able to step in whenever it is uh, necessary. Now this evening, uh, we want to talk about uh, a question. The question I want to ask and to put it on the floor is, am I growing spiritually? Spiritual growth is the only measurements that we have of faithfulness and as a child of God, you have to be able to ascertain the reality of whether or not you are growing spiritually or not. You have to be able to tell that. Spiritual growth is different than attendance. I'm not saying am I faithfully attending. Uh, you can be faithfully attending and not grow spiritually. Uh, spiritual growth is a process that uh, it takes a deliberate, intentional effort. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5 through 7, which is a familiar text for a lot of us, uh, but also, this is the New King James Version, but also for this very reason, he says, given all diligence, you need to make great efforts to add to your faith, virtue, faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, uh, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Now, we want to explore these a little different here. You see, if you look at this chart, your spiritual growth chart, and you have to measure yourself. Every child of God needs to be able to monitor where they are spiritually. Every child of God needs to be able to measure where they are spiritually. And for, for Pete's sake, don't lie to you. I mean, you, if you're trying to fool the other folk, okay, I get that. But when it comes to your own spiritual development, don't try to fool yourself. You're either growing spiritually or you're not. If you're not, you need to do something about it. If you are, but you are lacking in some areas, you need to adjust. So are you growing spiritually? Now the first part that we see in this text in 2 Peter, the first part is faith. Faith is the foundation. Faith is the rationale. Faith is the ingredient that is necessary and essential for any spiritual growth to take place. There is no motive that you have for being like God if you don't have any faith. If, it, if you don't believe that it really matters whether or not you be like God or whether or not God is demonstrated through your life, if it really doesn't matter, that means you don't have faith in what God says. And if you don't have faith in what God says, I know you're not growing spiritually because you don't have the faith that's necessary for you to put forth the effort, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. If you don't hear the Word of God speaking to your life in such a way that you are willing to adjust your behavior based on what you understand the Word of God to say to you, then you don't have faith. 
And if you don't have faith, then you cannot please God. There's no need to talk about any of the other graces spiritually if you don't have faith. Faith is the foundation. Faith is essential. Faith is necessary for any spiritual growth to take place. Why are you willing to forgive somebody? The only rationale is because God told me. And since he told me, I believe it. I want to align with his will. Therefore, I am learning how to forgive my brother. There would be no motive other than pleasing God and being obedient to him that would put you in a position to say, I'm going to forgive. So it is with everything that God asks of us, the only reason why the greatest motive for doing it is because we believe God said it. And since we believe God said it, we are willing to do what is necessary to align ourselves with the will of God. Now, faith. Faith is, of course, the first characteristic. For without it, we are no different than the pagans in the world around us. If we don't exercise faith, we are no different than the folk who really don't know God. It, again, it doesn't matter what we do by coming. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, being sure of what we hope for, being sure of what we're hoping for, and certain of what we do not see. Faith says that I believe that God is going to do. I've not, not seen it. I have no physical evidence, but I believe, and I'm going to take God at his word, and since I'm taking at his word, I'm going to act like it's there even though I don't see it. I'm going to do what I know is acts of me even though I can't see it. Romans 10, 17, again, so then faith cometh by what? Hearing, hearing by the word of God. Let me just make a footnote. It is important what we hear and making sure what we hear aligns with the word of God. If you are hearing things that don't align with the word of God and you start believing those things, you start acting those things, you are listening to the wrong thing, you are hearing the wrong thing, therefore God has no obligation to regulate a life that's not obeying his word. If you are not following his word, but you are following a word, you have to make sure that the word that you're following is actually the word of God. So the question that you need to ask right now, number one, am I diligently striving to stand on what I believe God's word teaches? Foundational. There's no need of moving from here. If you don't strive, if you're not willing to strive to stand on what you believe the word of God is teaching, then we don't need to go any further because without faith, you can't please him. So the issue then for children of God is, it's not what we know. We know what the word teaches. That's not the issue. The issue is, am I striving to do what I believe the word of God is teaching? If you are not making every effort to do what you think the word of God is teaching, then you don't have faith. I'll say that again. If you know the word of God teaches this, but you are not making a diligent effort to do this, then you don't have faith. Now, I'm not getting into why you don't have faith. There's various reasons, you know. But the, the bottom line is you are not living by faith. You are not acting by faith. So faith is the foundational piece. And you need to ask yourself, am I diligently, if I'm making every effort, striving, am I pushing to stand on what I believe in God's word as it teaches about my faith? Faith is the first thing. So the next part of spiritual growth to tell whether or not you're growing spiritually is virtue. It's virtue. Now virtue, we're going to define as the goodness or moral excellence. Moral excellence. Goodness or virtue is that quality of you that knows you are denying you of things that you know you may enjoy, but you are denying it because of virtue. Now, 2 Peter 1, 3 says, His divine power has given unto us everything we need for life, for godliness, through our knowledge of him 
who have called us by his own glory and goodness. Everything that we need. So virtue is a quality that you need to know that you are making diligent efforts to live morally excellent. Moral excellence. Now, morality can be defined in a whole lot of areas. Don't have time today to get into all the areas that morality can cover. But you need to know, am I in good conscience doing what I believe God is asking me to do, living the way I believe God is asking me to live, sacrificing the way I believe God is asking me to sacrifice. That's moral excellence. I know I'm keeping my life in alignment with what I believe the Word of God teaches. So am I diligently striving for moral excellence? You need to answer that for yourself. Then the third part is knowledge. Knowledge. Now, knowledge here we're going to define that leads to wisdom and discernment that enables Christians to live godly lives. How are we able to live godly lives based on the Word of God if we don't know what the Word of God teaches in regards to this situation? If we don't understand what the Word of God is teaching, then how are we going to act in knowledge? Knowledge leads to wisdom, wisdom as the execution of the knowledge, and discernment, discernment, being able to look at a circumstance in your life and determine what is the best course of action for me to take in this circumstance. What is the best spiritual thing for me to say in this circumstance? What is the best spiritual thing for me to do in this circumstance? That's discernment. Now, when a person of God doesn't execute discernment, then they don't think about what they ought to do. They do what they feel like doing best. They are now living into their own flesh. They are operating in the flesh or carnality and not operating by the spirit. Why? Because you have to use spiritual wisdom. You need to know what the word says. There is no circumstance that you have in your life that the word of God does not dictate how you behave. I'm going to say that again. There is not a circumstance in your life that the word of God does not dictate how to behave. Behavior is a demonstration of one's trusting the word and aligning oneself to do what the word says. It is, it is that, that behavior change. You are changing behavior because of your wisdom and knowledge of the word, and you're making a discerning act. You're saying, I feel like saying this in this circumstance, but spiritual wisdom say this is something I ought not say, and discernment says I need to do it this way. So when you're executing spiritual discernment, then you are able to live godly. If you are not exercising spiritual discernment, you are going through life, you are reacting to what life does, whatever life gives you, and your response sometimes and many times or oft times is contrary to the will and word of God. Now, Ephesians 5, 17 says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise. As the child of God, don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What, what, the interpretation, what does God will for me to do in this circumstance? One of the questions that a child of God has to continually ask themselves is, as I'm in a certain circumstance, some of these circumstances challenge my feelings, but I have to say, what is the will of God for me in this circumstance? Do I understand what God wills for me to do? Now, I know what I feel. I know what I'm feeling. And my feeling says I should do this. But if I'm acting under the will of God and I have discernment, then I must say, okay, that, even though I feel this way, I can't act this way and stay in the wheel. I can't say it like this and stay in the wheel. So you, you want to be, be wise. You got to understand what the will of God is for your life. So the question that you need to ask yourself as it relates to knowledge, am I diligently striving to learn more so I can do more? Sometimes the end result that we have in church is learning. Oh, that was a great word. Oh, the preacher preached today. 
Man, that was so true. And then we go home and nothing change. We go and nothing changed. We act the same way we acted before we heard the word. Then what we see, we like to learn, but we don't like to do what we know. Doing what we know demands buffeting your body. You have to bring yourself under the submission of the will of God in order to do what you know. Now, we know a whole lot more about the word of God than we demonstrate in our actions. We know a whole lot more about the word of God. We can quote the book. We know what it says. That ain't the issue. The issue is, am I willing to do it? Like it says it ought to be done. So knowledge, knowledge is another spiritual trait that, that you need to measure yourself by. The wisdom and discernment that enables you to live a godly life. Then we talk about temperance. The next step of growth, temperance. Temperance is self-control. This refers to mastery. This is learning how to master you over sinful human desires in every aspect of your life. Every area of your life, you got to learn how to master your desires for sin. Now, let me, let me give you some information that, that may sound, sound funny, but let me tell you the truth. Every child of God has secret desires for sin. Now, whether we execute them or not, that is up to our self-control. It's not that we don't have the desire. Let me say that again. Children of God have to wrestle with the desires that you have to sin. Now, if you say that you don't have a desire, then 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 calls God a lie. Okay? If you say you don't have sin, then you're lying. If you don't have desire to sin, then you are not human. Because in our humanity, we have to bring our flesh in submission to the will of God all the time. So learning how to master you, learning how to bring you in submission. A lot of times we want to monitor how everybody else is controlling themselves. And we want to measure how everybody else control it. And we can tell when people are out of control. You know, she didn't do that right. You know, she should have said he didn't say that right. So we are looking at others control, but we have no say so over controlling somebody else's desires. You have to master you. And you got to master you in every aspect of your life. You got to bring you in control of every aspect of your life. It's the ability to hold yourself in versus letting yourself out. Everybody with me? See, see, and, and do you know when you let yourself out? See, anytime you let yourself out, you will always see a parallel contradiction of the word of God. You know why? Because you let yourself go. Now, you knew what the word says, but you just couldn't hold yourself. So you couldn't master your desire to not act that way, not say that thing, not do that thing, because you haven't brought yourself under control. Now, let me help you with something. Self-control and the bringing yourself under self-control is not a one-time thing. It's not a one-day thing. It's really not a one-week thing. It is an ongoing, daily thing. Let me say that again. It is every day recognizing when you are letting your nature out. That human nature of yours versus the nature that God is trying to place in us and you're fulfilling that nature. Now, if you let you out, I don't care why you let you out. You had to do it. Because your desire was greater to let you out than to do what God says. I'm going to say that again. You have to bring your life into submission and self-control. Otherwise, you will allow yourself out. And then justify being out. 
You're justifying it because you know it didn't look right, but you need a rational reason to give people a reason to say, uh, now I know that wasn't Christ-like, but I needed to do that. Really? Really, that's what you're convincing yourself. See, you're just out of control. God gives us his spirit to help us to gain self-control. Control over self is one of the greatest evidences of a surrendered life to God. It's one of the greatest evidences that you have given over yourself to God. Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit. By the way, there's one fruit that manifests itself in different ways. There are not different fruit. There's one fruit, and as a result of having the fruit of the Spirit, these things come out of that. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, goodness, meekness, temperance. That's a fruit of the Spirit. When the Spirit is working appropriately in your life, you have the ability to control you. When the Spirit is not reigning over you, you will let yourself out. The more you let yourself out <laughs> is an evidence of your lack of control over you. Everybody with me? So am I diligently striving to bring my life in total control with God's word and his will. Am I making an effort to bring my life in total control with God's word and his will? We're talking about am I growing spiritually? This is, this is the test, this is the litmus test. This is how you know whether or not you're growing. It ain't, it ain't attendance, it ain't taking the Lord's Supper, it ain't t giving tempers. It, listen, you have to be able to master your nature. And as you master you, okay, that's an evidence of your surrendering, submission to God. The next thing is patience. Patience is a spiritual trait that every child of God has to learn how to add to your life. Perseverance, the ability to steadfastly endure suffering or evil without giving up your faith. Now let me help you with something. Learning how to endure hardship is hard for children of God. Because generally the people that you're doing a hardship from are children of God. So you have a hard time accepting hardship from children of God because it don't make sense that a child of God to you ought to be doing you like that. Remember this, Christianity is not fair. Christianity is not fair. Being a child of God is not becoming a part of an organization where everything is going to work the way it's supposed to work. Don't be blindsided when you have to endure suffering or some evil and you spend all your time trying to figure out how in the world it ain't fair, it shouldn't have happened, this shouldn't have happened to me, I didn't deserve this, you end up giving up your faith in God's word because you were done wrong. You got to have the ability to endure suffering. Jesus, Peter wrote, you know, those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you didn't get the memo, there it is. If you go live godly, you shall suffer. That's your memo. You're going to be persecuted. So you got to have the ability to endure wrong and keep your faith while doing it. You don't endure the wrong and then have to bring everybody in to let everybody know how wrong it is for you to have to endure this wrong. You know, it ain't fair that I got to go through this. And then you got to tell everybody and anybody that will listen about the wrong that happened to you. Now, you are not only 
outside of the will of God, but now you're wounding your brothers and sisters by putting this on their heart and they didn't have to deal with that. Now you're giving that to them. Am I helping anybody? James 1, 3. You need to know because the testing of your faith will always develop perseverance. And by the way, how do you know whether or not you have faith in this area? You got to go through something. Anytime you start praying, uh, Lord, give me, you know, this, or give me that, patience. Lord, give me this. Get ready for the testing. Get ready for the testing. There is no way to develop Patience without being tried. Without having a situation in your life that requires for you to be steadfast when things ain't the way you want them to be and keep your faith. Everybody with me? So the question then is, am I diligently striving to endure, endure the suffering without giving up on my faith? I can't tell you the number of children of God who got wounded and stopped coming to church because they got wounded by somebody at church. They were wounded at church from friendly fire, (laughs) so to speak. That's the military term. That means that you got shot by somebody on your side. All right? They supposed to be on your side. That's friendly fire, okay? So perseverance. Next thing. Godliness. Your spiritual growth should lead itself to more and more godliness. Godliness we're going to define as your conduct, your conduct that shows you're aware of God's presence at all times. I I love that. I just love that. Are you aware that God's in you at all times? Now, if you're aware God is with you and in you at all times, watching and noting everything that's going on, there are just some things you can't do with you knowing God is right with you. You can't say some things when you know he's right here. So it's being a, living godly is a choice. There are some things that we can do that are not godly that may not destroy the world but they erode your soul. They erode your soul because you feel like you have license to not be spiritual in this area and you give yourself license to do some things that God's word doesn't allow and if you're not careful, your soul starts to be eroding because you now becoming callous to doing what God says and you don't feel you have to do it all the time. Titus 2, 11 and 12. Paul writes, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's grace has appeared to all men. Watch this. What does grace do? It teaches us. See, the grace of God is teaching, teaches us to say no. You have to learn how to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Ungodliness and worldly passions. Anything that we do that doesn't line up with the word of God and we're a child of God is ungodly. Anything that we allow ourselves to be drawn into because of our fleshly desire is worldly passion. You have to control your godliness and your passions. That's some things that we like to do that just ain't right. Now, you know it ain't right but you like to do it. You got to bring that in control. So you got to be self-controlled and to live upright and godly lives in this present age. So question, am I diligently striving to conduct myself in ways that reflect my awareness of God's presence in my life? Again, as a child of God, you got to know he's with you all the time. We used to sing a song, you know, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I, I am his own. 
You got to know that he's with you all the time. You got to live like he's with you all the time. Footnote, when you're driving down the highway, he's with you. So when somebody does something that is not right or fair, how do you respond? It's just you and God. It's just you and God in the vehicle. Ain't nobody else there. So does God see you say and do the right thing? Or does God watch you lose spiritual control of yourself because somebody did something wrong driving? Now, if you have the license to do that because somebody's driving, what else do you give yourself license to do? See, it don't just stop there. That's just one of the evidence. And then brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, having a real affection for other children of God. Having a real affection where you really care, not just for the people that you like, okay, not just those people, but the people of God, period. A brotherly kindness, affection. You know, you remember the body of Christ, there's a faith. We have a kinship. First John 4 and 20, John writes, if anyone says, I love God, and we're quick to say, oh, I love Jesus. If anyone says, John says, I love God, yet hates his brother, sister, generically, he's a liar. You lying if you say you love God and you hate your fellow brother or sister. For anyone who does not love his brother, generically, whom you have seen, you've seen your brother and sister, every, you've seen them, you touch them, you can, you can talk to them, you're around them, and you hate them, you, you don't love them, okay? You cannot love God who you have never seen. You're fooling yourself. Why? Because God's love is manifested through his children. Jesus said, when you do it to the least of those that belong to me, you've done it to me. If you can muster up the will to act like you don't love a child of God, for whatever reason, then how you can say you love the God that you can't see and you are not willing to demonstrate love to your fellow man? So the question, am I diligently striving to demonstrate brotherly kindness to all people? Now, this chart, your spiritual growth chart, Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. You have to measure yourself in these areas. You have to measure you. Let me help you with something else. It ain't your job, my job to measure everybody else's spiritual growth. You better work, you got enough to measure yours and keep yours straight. You ain't got time to be measuring anybody else's spiritual growth. You know, sister so-and-so need to work on their, their godliness. <laughs> you know, brother so No, you ain't got time for that. You, they got to stand before God. Let me help you with something. Every person has to stand before God and not you. Nobody will have to stand before you in judgment. Everybody has to stand before God. Stop judging folk. Leave it up to God. Make sure you got your stuff in line. Because believe me, it takes all you got to keep you in line. Uh, believe me, 
Oh, I'm not, am I the only one that struggles to do this? You know, I mean, come on. See, love then is the ability to put others first. Love, love. Seeking somebody else's highest good. That's love. 1 Corinthians 13 points it out. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not boast. It's not proud. Love is not rude. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Not if you love them. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You know that pad we got that lists everything that was done and when it was done and, 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 and you still hold? Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. You see, this is the thing that we got to have. So the last, am I diligently striving to love my brothers and sisters unconditionally? In other words, do I put conditions on whether I love? How many times do they have to wrong you before you put them on do not love list? How many times do they have to make you mad before you put them on the do not love list? I want you to know if you have a do not love list, you are not spiritual. You can't have a do not love list as a child of God. You can't have that list as a child of God. You can have one, but not as a child of God. Everybody with me? So these eight qualities mentioned, these things above, ought to be part of every believer's life. But watch this, they're not static. They're increasing in. Faith. Yeah, I got faith. I got more. I got more of the. No, 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 no. You have to be increased. Not have them. That means that there is room for everybody to grow in these areas. No child of God has arrived to full maturity. No child of God has arrived to full maturity. Nobody. But if you're not working on it, if you're not aware of it, if it's not on the radar that you need to be doing this, guess what happened? You don't grow at all. And you fool yourself into spiritual maturity because you show up, because you do this, because no spiritual traits are being demonstrated. You have to grow in these areas. So to grow in these qualities, you got to practice them through the rough and tumble of daily life. You see, that's one of the reasons why you can't grow spiritually to the highest point worshiping online by yourself. You know why? Because you are avoiding the contact that's necessary with people that you need so they can do you wrong so you can grow. <laughs> you can't get that at home. You need the agitation. You know, I need a brother to do me wrong every now and then to make sure I'm still growing. Now, you don't have to do me wrong all the time, okay? But, you know, you need it every now and then. You have to learn how to thank God for your trials. That's why when James writes in James chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall, my brother, we count it all joy when you fall into the devil's temptation, knowing this, that the trying of our faith, because everything that is a trial, it tests your faith. And this faith, if you endure, work is patience. So as these characteristics increase in you, they keep believers from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. You can be 
effectively doing things and totally ineffective as a child of God. Now, chew on that now. You can be doing some stuff that's right, but totally ineffective because you're not growing in these things. Am I helping anybody? All right. So how complete then is your growth? This is for you. How complete is your growth? You got to answer that for yourself. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to bring the word of God into your lives. And for those of you online, I want you to know that we invite you to join us live. There's nothing like being live to our services on Sunday and on Wednesdays. Nothing like being live. We invite you to participate and become a part of what we are doing here live whenever you can. But if this lesson or the lessons that you've heard or previously heard, if these things that you are hearing, they make you see where you are and seeing where you are, you know you need to make a change. Then we're going to give you an opportunity. We ask that you repent, turn your life back to God. If you're not a child of God, we invite you to become a part of God's spiritual family. You come by hearing the word that Jesus died for our sins, according to the scripture. He was buried and rose again on the third day. If you're willing to repent of your sins, confess him as Lord, and surrender to baptism for the remission of your sins, you'll be added to the body called the church. And for those of us who are part of the family of God, we invite you, if you know you are not where you need to be, Repent. Change your mind. Start making the effort. You don't just develop this because you show up. You develop these things because you work at it. And the more you work at it, the better you get at it. So we thank you for being a part of our service. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for an opportunity to share your word. We thank you, Father, and we trust that we've shared it in a way that has integrity to your will, your desires for your people. Father, we ask you to help us to measure ourselves spiritually, to see where we are. We ask you, in, 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 give us in your spirit, nudge us to help us to know what we need to work on. And may we have the courage to work on those things that you nudge us in. Help us to have spiritual integrity with you. We thank you so much for you being patient with us to give us time to get our lives together. We ask this prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.